asking Nova Scotians who have had their first dose to get their second dose as soon as possible. We are also asking Nova Scotians who have not yet gotten their first dose to take that step. Uh, to protect themselves, to protect their family, to protect others. Right now, we expect to be at almost 72 percent uh, fully vaccinated by the end of August. And Dr. Strang has confidence that we can meet our 75 percent target by, by the middle of September, uh, or maybe even sooner. That's why today we're setting September 15th as the target date to move to phase five. This date is based on the projected timeline to hit that goal of 75 percent of the population fully vaccinated. If we hit the target sooner, we'll work with public health to change the date accordingly. But we want to give Nova Scotians a sense of where we are and what the plan is so that they can begin to plan themselves. I know everyone is asking what does phase five mean. Uh, and quite simply, it means no restrictions or mandatory public health me measures. And that's something that I know most of us are really, really looking forward to. Uh, we'll continue to have appropriate border measures and, and isolation for travelers who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, because with most of the cases related to travel, continuing to protect our borders is key to limiting the spread of COVID in uh, Nova Scotia. So to that end, given the situation in New Brunswick, and the connection to new cases here at home. Dr. Strang is today recommending we reestablish border measures with New Brunswick. If you're fully vaccinated, these restrictions will not apply to you. However, if you're not, they will. Uh, and they are that Nova Scotians and New Brunswickers who are not fully vaccinated but are traveling will have to quarantine on re-entry or entry into Nova Scotia. And that will be a week of quarantine and testing if you've had one dose and two weeks if you've not had any uh, vaccine at all. We expect this to impact a very small number of people uh, and an even smaller number of people when you consider that there will be protocols in place for healthcare and other workers, for students, for quick drop-offs and quick ups, uh, in, ins and outs, uh, to name just a few. Uh, the reality is being cautious has kept this province safe and we will continue to be cautious. Part of life returning to some semblance of normal means the return to school. So with just a few weeks left for summer vacation for students, sorry guys, um, just a few weeks left though, we're also announcing today the back to school plan. Uh, school starts for students on September 7th. Since we likely will not be in phase five by then, Masking will still be required in schools for the time being. We will reassess that requirement uh, for phase five and transition to voluntary use of masks in our schools uh, as we get closer. But beyond masking, back to school should look very familiar for students, teachers and staff. Following the advice of Dr. Strang and his team at Public Health, schools will return to a more normal routine. Key lessons learned, like more enhanced cleaning, will, will of course continue. Um, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Strang to provide more details and, and context of both Phase 5 and the upcoming school year. Dr. Strang. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon everybody. And first I'd like to congratulate and welcome you uh, Premier-designate. Uh, today we are talking about how things are likely to look in September. The fourth wave has arrived in many parts of the world and case numbers are rising even in Canada. Right now our case numbers are manageable, there's no sign of community spread, and most of our cases are related to travel or, or close contacts of previous cases. But it's only a matter of time before the first, sorry, before the fourth wave is here in Nova Scotia too. We should expect to see increasing case numbers and even localized outbreaks, largely in unvaccinated groups. The key to getting through the fourth wave is vaccine. And I can't say that strongly enough. The more vaccinated we are, the less impact a fourth wave will have on people, our healthcare system and our economy. We are in good shape, but we aren't where we need to be yet. About 70% of Nova Scotians are fully vaccinated and we are leading the country with our vaccination rates. And I'm proud, as you should be, of the work Nova Scotians have done to protect one another. Our target to move into Phase 5 is 75% of all Nova Scotians with two doses of vaccine. 
We had hoped to reach that by the end of August. Now we expect to be at 72% by then, which is close, but not close enough. We need everyone who had their first dose to get their second dose as soon as possible. And if that is you, if you're waiting for your second dose, please do not wait. Move up your appointment, get your second dose now. Every 10,000 people who does moves us one percentage point closer to our target. And I also want to reiterate that it's never too late to get your first dose. The Premier designate noted that there were 100,000 people who could get vaccine but haven't yet received vaccine. Now is the time, if not to protect your own health, then to protect those who can't get vaccinated, like children under 12. And I do want to mention two key issues related to vaccines, additional doses and vaccine mandates or policies. Some jurisdictions have decided to provide third doses of vaccine for people who are immune compromised. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization, our expert group in Canada, is looking at this issue and will make a recommendation in September. They are the experts and we will wait to hear from them. There's also been a lot of talk about vaccine policies. Some organizations are requiring employees to be fully vaccinated and some governments are granting access to certain services and activities based on vaccination status. Throughout this pandemic, Nova Scotians have done what is needed to protect themselves and others, whether it's keeping your distance, wearing your mask, or getting vaccine. We are hoping Nova Scotians will continue to keep doing the right thing. If you can get vaccinated, please do it. It's safe and effective and will protect you and those around you. Your choice about vaccination needs to balance a right to choose with an equal responsibility to protect those around you. So we are watching our vaccine rates and epidemiology closely and will bring forward recommendations on vaccine policy if we feel that is what, it, what is needed to keep Nova Scotians safe. As the Premier noted, we are now targeting September 15th for the final phase of our reopening plan. By then, we expect to meet our 75% two-dose target so we can start living without restrictions and without mandatory measures. While our border policy will likely remain in place through the fall, most other restrictions, like gathering limits, masks, and physical distancing will be lifted. We will continue to require self-isolation and testing for those entering Nova Scotia who are not fully vaccinated. The policy will not change for travelers coming from provinces and territories outside of Atlantic Canada. And starting August 25th at 8 a.m., we're also expanding it to include New Brunswick. New Brunswick has seen a recent rise in cases and some of our cases in the last week are directly linked to that province. I know many Nova Scotians and New, Brun New Brunswickers frequently travel back and forth. You should not be impacted by these changes as we will have the same protocols in place for these circumstances. that we have had previous to the health direction. High vaccination rates and low case numbers means we won't need to focus on general asymptomatic testing, so we will begin eliminating that option. It will still be available to incoming travelers who need it and to close contacts of confirmed cases and anyone else who is directed by public health to get tested. And we will also continue to use rapid testing for screening and surveillance at workplaces throughout the province. But things like masking, physical distancing, and gathering limits will no longer be necessary. 
And I'm sure there are mixed views on this. Some will be thrilled to get rid of masks and others will be nervous to stop wearing them. And that's totally normal. It's time to start living more with COVID. Even if we see rising case numbers that would have previously meant province-wide restrictions, our vaccine coverage means that we can carry on with only border restrictions and maybe, if necessary, targeted local restrictions. But we also need to keep practicing the good habits that help reduce the spread of COVID-19 and quite frankly, will also help reduce the spread of influenza and a range of other uh, um, uh, or organisms that cause other respiratory and other gastrointestinal illnesses. So staying home when you're sick, washing your hands regularly, coughing and sneezing into your elbow, and regularly cleaning high-touch surfaces are important whether restrictions are in place or not. And as I said, they'll also protect us from a range of other viruses and bacteria. Even though masks won't be mandatory in most places, we, will, we still strongly recommend that you keep wearing them in indoor public places, especially as we move into the fall and winter. And I'll, let me just touch uh, uh, bases, uh, touch briefly now on the school reopening plan. It is based on public health guidance from my team and lines up with the direction we're going in in general as we enter phase five. Students, teachers and staff have two different, uh, sorry, have had two difficult years. This year should be easier. The school routine will look almost normal. And when we move into phase five, masking will become voluntary for schools as well. With our vaccination rates and current epidemiology, I'm comfortable with the plan put forward by the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. As the Premier said, if we keep our community safe, our schools will be safe. We need to balance the risk of COVID-19 with the impact COVID has, has had on young Nova Scotians. In-person schooling is vital for, for, for a child and youth development. We need school to be as familiar as possible while keeping staff and students as safe as possible. The back to school plan sees a return to all school activities like sports, band, music, food programs and clubs. Visitors will be allowed into schools following core public health measures. And school gyms will be open to community use after hours. If there is a case of COVID in a school, family, staff and close contacts will be notified, but people should expect schools to stay open. If there are rising case numbers in a school or community, then we'll act quickly to put measures in place in that school or in that community to control things. But our goal will continue to be to keep schools operating and open as normally as possible. COVID-19 has started to move from a pandemic to a more regular part of our lives. We, but we need to begin to live with COVID. And to do that, we need enough Nova Scotians to get fully vaccinated. When that happens is ultimately up to us. So please get vaccinated, especially people who are age 12 to 35. And keep practicing the healthy habits that have helped keep us safe. Wear a mask even when you don't have to. Indoor, indoor places when you're around other people. Wash your hands and stay home when you're sick. Heather. Uh, before we begin the Q&A part, I'm hearing that we're having a little glitch with our Wi-Fi, our live feed. So if you're using our Wi-Fi in the room, if you're able to get off it, we'd appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, we are going to open it up for questions from media in the room and on the telephone lines. For those on the phones that may have not heard earlier, we are introducing a new format today. So we're going to open it up to the room for questions for about 20 minutes, then I will turn it over. I will check in on the phones, and we have quite a few outlets on the phone, so we'll do, I'll call you out by name for one question, we'll go through the list, and then we'll return um, for a second time if there's time to do so, and then return to the room for final questions. All right, so we'll open it up to questions in the room. Go ahead, please. Mr. Houston, congratulations. Last time, Mr. Houston, congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Well, last time New Brunswick was singled out, we had an issue at the border. Uh, I'm wondering whether uh, you have talked to Premier Higgs and whether, uh, and I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Strang to also comment on this, and whether both provinces are on the same page with what it is Nova Scotia is proposing. Yep, absolutely, on the, on the same page, have been in contact with uh, Premier Higgs' office, and 
and you know, I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that this is these restrictions are for for unvaccinated people. So that's 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 a cohort of people. It's not for everyone. Those that are fully vaccinated, it's uh, business as usual. But for those that are unvaccinated, there, there's restrictions, and and you know, both provinces are on the same page around those restrictions. Yeah, I've, I've also contacted uh, Dr. Russell. Uh, we're both working to th think what are the things in place that are going to uh, support and in encourage people in both our provinces to get vaccinated. So, if they're if they're if they're in the Category. Have to uh, you know go to our safe arrival online, upload their proof of vaccination, uh, and that's that's what's been in place uh, since uh, since July for all the other you know uh, pro non Atlantic provinces. Mr. Heason, a couple of back to school questions. What consideration, if any, was given to following New Brunswick's model, where teachers are either required to be vaccinated or failing that, uh, be subject to regular testing? It's not something. I mean, there's there is discussion around overall vaccine policy. Um, you know, for for that would be for schools. That would be for for other for other institutions as well. But right now, at this point in time, and and Dr. Strang can add to this. But with with our epidemiology in this province, with our vaccination rates in this province, uh, and and our and our history, schools have been safe in this province um, through the whole pandemic. So, I think when when you factor in those things, I think that the it, I had great great comfort in the plan that I saw. Post secondary institutions are moving forward with mandatory vaccinations. For parents who are concerned that teachers aren't mandated to be vaccinated, especially given that children under 12 may still be at risk because they can't get vaccinated, what do you say to those concerns that are being brought forth by uh, parents? Well, I say first off, I mean, um, at least until we get to phase five, which is a, which is probably a couple weeks away, there will be masking and other, and other you know, the, the, the cleaning, the advanced cleaning criteria is still in place. So I think I think overall, when you look at, uh, we we can't lose sight of our of our overall vaccination rate in this province. I mean that that's an important thing. We we, we we're at we're at somewhere in the range of 72 percent right now, fully vaccinated. Um, when we get to phase five, it'll be 75 percent fully vaccinated. That's a, that's you know compared to other jurisdictions that are that are instituting other restrictions, different restrictions. They have different vaccination rates. They have different epidemi epidemiology. So, well, I guess my my overriding message to educators um, and to to parents and to students themselves is we, we'll do everything to keep you safe. And, and right now with the plan we have today, we feel that that keeps people safe. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, yeah. Add to that, I think you know looking at that, our, our overall vaccine vaccination rates, but even uh, knowing that if you go by age, by, by age breakdown, the 35 and above have very high vaccination rates. So that's the, the, mo the vast majority of teachers are in that age cohort. So I don't think we have a huge amount of unvaccinated teachers out there. Uh, we're, and our, we have actually, we're uh, very good in terms of the 12 to, to 18 year olds. Uh, it's the 20 to th the 35 year olds that are still doing well, but not as well as everybody else. So we always have to look at uh, what we're doing in a, and there's a principle in public health you have the least intrusive measures necessary. So we've done very well in Nova Scotia by following an educative approach uh, and supporting people to get vaccinated. As I said in my remarks, we'll continue to look at our vaccine coverage and, and look overall in terms of where, where, where we might need to have a policy-based approach to go to, that, to go to that last step, if you will, to make sure we have the highest possible vaccine coverage. If we were at the 75% coverage right now, would these New Brunswick restrictions be mandated again and re-implement it today if we were at that August end goal of 75 percent? So that's one factor, but the other fact, the main factor that's driving uh, adding a, a additional restrictions for New Brunswick is uh, the epidemiology in New Brunswick and what we're seeing is that that's been driven by you know, unvaccinated people and we're starting to now see again mostly in unvaccinated in Nova Scotia, but we're starting to see some uh, cases in Nova Scotia uh, and contacts in Nova Scotia linked directly back to New Brunswick. So we, we, we feel it's necessary to put that extra layer of protection, if you will, focused on people who are unvaccinated, that you can't just come freely into Nova Scotia. You need a period of quarantine. To me, that's very legitimate to our whole goal is to keep Nova Scotians safe and people who choose to be unvaccinated
Section 8 are going to have to go to extra extra measures to keep the rest of us safe. Yeah, it's, uh, <coughs> congratulations, by the way. It's, it's six days ago you won, but it's a bit unusual to see a premier designate uh, essentially acting as the premier in a sense. I'm just wondering if you could sort of walk us through how this came about today, that you're the one sitting in front of us and, and, and that we're, we're having this news conference today with you telling us what you're going to do. I think probably um, this is my first transition, so I'm not really sure. But I mean, I think probably every transition is a bit is a bit unique. Um, so, I will say that I um, I was very sincere in in the outreach to have an all party committee to talk about to talk about COVID uh, and and where we go from here. There wasn't much uptake uh, from the other from the other parties. So. Um, look, Nova Scotians are anxious for the back to school plan. Nova Scotians are anxious to know what phase five might look like and, and when that might happen. So, so here we are today uh, communicating, communicating that to Nova Scotians. Mr. Houston, um, <coughs> you and Dr. Strang have both talked about how if this is going to work, people have to continue to follow public health guidelines, including staying home when they are sick. And one of the things that we heard throughout the pandemic is that for some people, they're quite literally making the decision between staying home when they're sick and whether or not they have enough money to pay rent. Where are you and your team on the question of paid sick days for everybody so that they don't have to make that decision? Yeah, I mean, look, nobody wants people having to make those types of decisions, particularly not during a pandemic. So we, I, I, I understand the, the emotions of those decisions. But for me, it's a, you know, I'm just getting up to speed on a, on a number of files, um, and that would be one of them. But my, my position all along has been um, to the extent that there is a, uh, is a need for paid sick days. Um, that's that's a discussion that the province needs to have with the federal government. There's a role for the federal government in that. So these are there's a number of things that um, we'll be talking to the federal government about. Obviously, healthcare in general is is something that I'm passionate about fixing, and there'll be a there'll be you know a need for partnership at the federal level on that. There's a number of other things as well. So we have a lot of discussions to have with the federal government. That'd be uh, one of the. Some jurisdictions, but um, I'm just wondering if you. Uh, if, if we're moving this to phase five, perhaps in, in just uh, just mid September, <coughs> do you expect the state of emergency will also be lifted around that time? Um, so, so I guess I'll go first. But um, there's a the, the state of emergency um, has a, just being in a state of emergency has a number of implications. Um, obviously, it gives some some authority around border controls. It gives some uh, some authority to make some public health decisions. Uh, there are other ramifications as well around different types of insurances and 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 and, and things like that. So, it's it's one of the things that I'm you know, we're going to get a full briefing on the, exactly what the state of emergency means, uh, and then we'll make some decisions on that. But um, but my focus right now um, today and and over the last few days and in, in working with Dr. Strang and his team has been uh, on back to school. And you know we've had discussions with the NSTU on on the back to school, with the department on the back to school. So, so that's a primary a primary focus, um, and also communicating phase five. You know what, what 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 phase five means, and when people could reasonably expect that to happen. Obviously, the New Brunswick border thing is something that's kind of came up over the last few days as well. So there's there's lots of issues uh, around the pandemic management. And we're going to work closely with public health on, on all of them, including the removal of the state of emergency. Have you discussed this plan with educators before <coughs> announcing it today, or is this the first time they're hearing of it as well? Yeah, so um, there, there's been constant uh, discussions between the Department of Education, between the uh, NSTU, uh, and therefore educators, and, and public health. Uh, there, there's a subcommittee that, that talks back and forth on, on these issues, and that, that, that committee has met somewhere in the range of 100, 100 times, I think, is, is, is the most recent thing I heard. So it's been quite, it's been quite active. I mean, and, and I'm sure they probably don't agree on everything, but they've certainly had, had discussions, and, and elements of this plan are as a result of those discussions. So, uh, and, then, and then last, last evening, uh, the, the department, Dr. Strang, myself, um, had, a, had a conference call uh, with NSTU just to talk about some of the, some of the higher level elements of the plan. So um, I, think, I think that the, the bottom line is everyone is on the same page. 
and that is the page of making sure that schools are safe for students, that schools are safe for educators, and that families can have a high degree of confidence um, that the schools will be safe. And I think that's we've done well during the pandemic, and I, and I think everyone is on that same page that this is a path uh, to get us there. There was a suggestion recently that some people who have appointments for a second dose way, way down the road, we're going to have those appointments canceled in an effort to get our vaccination rate up sooner. Did that actually happen? Were those appointments canceled and people forced to rebook? Yeah, no, for, first of all, the canceling appointment is not, the purpose is not being to force people to move up. It's been, you know, we've had community clinics, uh, but, you know, when the community clinics were necessary and we had large volumes of people getting immunized, we don't need those people anymore, so we've closed them down. And and and, but that, and so because the clinics were closing down, those appointments were, were canceled. We certainly use that as an opportunity to say, say to people, your, 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 your original appointment is canceled, so please move it up and here's why you need to move it up. We're doing the same with our pharmacies. We no longer, given the volume of people still required to be immunized, we don't need all of our pharmacies to be open all the time. We certainly have, and I thank the pharmacy association, they've worked very creatively. So uh, I'll use, I'll, and I, I just use this example, I pick a community Bridgewater. We know that the pharmacies there are gonna work together so there will always be seven days a week at least one pharmacy that people in Bridgewater can go to but we don't need all of the pharmacies in Bridgewater open all the time, uh, given the volume of people. So because of that, there's been some, some people uh, uh, with some pharmacy appointments have had their appointments canceled. And again, using the opportunity for them to say, rebook your appointment, and here's why you need to rebook it as, as, as early as possible. But I think it's important to understand that the, the primary reason of canceling the appointments was not to force people to move things up. It was because of operationally the amount of capacity we need now in these last phases of our vaccine program. Dr. Strang, given that the school reopening will be among the largest gatherings we've seen in Nova Scotia in some time, why is just one week of mandatory mask wearing essential for getting back to school. School's going back on Tuesday the or the Tuesday or Wednesday. We if we're if we if things go well, we'll we'll uh, open, uh, you know look at the 15th for phase 5. We've already talked about that certainly that it would make sense to keep the masks on until the end of that week and make a transition over over the weekend. Uh, the reason the, the schools have indicated uh, the education system is they 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 are pleased with having at least a couple of weeks of of masking because it, it sets the norm. We still even even if once we remove the mandatory requirement for masking, like we want people to wear masks in indoor public places, we encourage and would strongly recommend staff and students continue to wear masks. So starting off the year uh, with the requirement of masking allows uh, the, the school year to start with and, and recreating that norm around masking. The schools can do do teaching, they're building it into the curriculum and get, get kids and, and student and the teachers kind of uh, back to, up to speed with all the protocols. So there's value in that. If for some reason, our epidemiology changes, uh, then we will relook at that. Um, or if we need to extend because we're not getting where we need with vaccines. But right now, once we get to that 75% target and our, and our epidemiology remains where it's at, we're in a very low risk place here in Nova Scotia. And it, it would not, my perspective, it wouldn't be justified to have mandatory masking even in schools. But if either of those situations changes, I will come back and have more conversation uh, with with Mr. Houston, and 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 we'll assess and say what's necessary to keep Nova Scotians safe. So, Mr. Houston, we have about 17 percent of schools in Nova Scotia that rely on passive ventilation, so opening windows or doors in order to get that airflow. Are those schools going to be upgraded with active ventilation for this school year? Uh, ventilation is a, is an ongoing discussion in, in terms of all capital projects around schools, and there and there's a number of them. But for purposes of uh, for purposes of, of COVID, um, I, I think I have a high degree of confidence that schools are safe, um, particularly with the masking for the first while. Will we get to higher vaccination rates across the community? So um, that's an ongoing discussion, um, but it's it's there's no there's no conclusion on that today. You were asked a question about the state of emergency. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about rent control. I know what your policy is on rent control, and you, you favor increased supply, but of course, building more supply takes time. And so when we look at the interim, 
What is your view on whether or not the, the current rent control that's in place should continue to be tied by the state of, to the state of the emergency, or do you foresee a scenario where it needs to be extended while that, that housing stock gets increased? I don't see a scenario with extending that. That's not something that I've been focused on. Um, I, I feel very sincerely that the, the, the solution to the housing crisis is, is more, more housing stock. I, I don't believe that rent control is a solution to the housing crisis. Yeah, I have calls from people who are, have lost their rental because of rent control. Somebody just said, I'm not renting anymore because of that. So there, it's a complicated issue uh, that requires a, a thoughtful solution. So what, what I would say to people is we're going to swear a, a cabinet in next week. And right away, the, the, the minister, the appropriate minister, and myself will meet with the Housing Commission too, the commission that studied this, and, and really, really get to work. We want to get to work. We understand the anxiety that uh, people are under. We, we, we're totally sympathetic to some of the some of the more dramatic situations we hear about. I mean, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I'm that I'm not concerned about it. I think every Nova Scotian is concerned about it. But at the same time, we, we have to have real solutions. Uh, we have a housing crisis. We have to address it. Um, and that's going to take some time. Do you the police involvement and use of force in the shelter evictions that took place last week? Uh, obviously, that was a, an HRM decision. Um, I, I've spoken to, to the mayor to try to understand, you know, how it got to that point, and, and there was, there was a, the number of steps that had, had happened along the way. So I'll have further discussions with them, but I, I don't think um, I don't think anyone wants to see violence on on either side. And law enforcement was doing doing their job; they were doing what they were asked to do. The bigger, the bigger, the bigger picture for me is the bigger question for me is how do we get to the point we have ten cities in downtown Halifax, and you know, we didn't have those eight years ago. So how do we get there? How do we get to uh, to the real solutions on that? But um, um, but as I say, that rent control, the housing crisis, all of these, all of these, you know, particularly sad situations we're seeing uh, are going to require they're going to require good good policy going forward. And I, I, if I had a magic wand, I would have pulled it out last week and fixed it. But we just don't have it. But we have to address the root causes of these issues if we want, if we really want to move the province forward. Dr. Strain, I know this is a politically charged conversation on the topic of what happened last week. But given that housing is a social determinant of health, and many health colleagues uh, of yours spoke out against the police action that was taken last week, saying it was disproportionate and not in the best interest of health, where do you stand on that? Well, I think we always have to look at understanding why people are homeless, uh, and that we we treat people in a in a compassionate, understanding uh, way, and and build and build in supports that uh, that we need a range of solutions uh, to the housing crisis. Some of it's affordability, some of it's people with mental health addiction issues that we need to do a better job of supporting in the, in the health and social supports, so they can you know be in in appropriate types of housing. Uh, so it. As, 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 as Mr. Houston said, this is complex, and there's no easy answers here. Um, but uh, hopefully, we can always ad address this by understanding that there are people uh, are, are there for a reason, and then how do we work with them to understand what are the solutions that are going to allow them to be in a in, in a safer uh, place? That uh, housing is a fundamental need for overall health. Dr. Strain, you have public health concerns about the use yeah. of pepper spray on a, on a public street. I'm not going to comment directly into kind of actions police took or did not did not take. Uh, I'm not, I've, I've, I've not been involved in enough detail of either side to make any comment on that. But I would say that we need to step back and look at how we do things moving forward, understanding there's uh, mm -hmm. there's reasons why people are out on the street without any homes, and how do we work together to build solutions to understand that they're going to work for people. And if people are saying they don't, they, the, the solutions that are given them are not not they're not going to work for them, then we need to understand what is going to work for them and work collectively uh, across communities to try to get those solutions in place. There are some jurisdictions there are some jurisdictions where kids who are 11 who are going into middle school who are close to turning 12 are being allowed to be vaccinated before getting into school. Is that something that we're looking at here? So that's an off-label use of the vaccine, right? It's it's uh, license. It's not actually licensed by Health Canada for for kids under 12. So, uh, you're, 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 that's a slippery slope. Those numbers are really small. As soon as kids reach 12, whether it's you know the day after school or in October, November, whatever, they become eligible for the vaccine, and we would encourage uh, them to get their parents to, to to get them vaccinated as soon as they turn 12. 
Okay, now we'll move to the phones. And as a reminder, I will call on each uh, outlet by name for one question. We'll rotate through the list in the time that allows, and then we'll return to the room for final questions, okay? Starting with Radio Canada, Adrian Blanc. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Strang, um, you said you wanted to make sure that 75% of the, vac the population is fully vaccinated. Uh, would a vaccine passport be a tool in the next weeks? So I think that the term for me, vaccine passport, we're really trying to do that's a That's a federal government conversation about how does proof of vaccination go along with your your actually real passport uh, to facilitate and support international travel. Uh, what we're talking about is, is is policies around people using proof of proof of vaccination, whether they have access to a range of services, uh, you know, within Nova Scotia, and how that may play out uh, domestically of traveling with, within the country. Uh, that that what we're focused on in, in Nova Scotia, Nova Scotians currently have proof of vaccination, but it's a little bit cumbersome for them to get. They have to go to the website with their health card number and those things. So there's active work going on, and it is to, this is a federal-led conversation. We expect some movement in the next few weeks to so people, Nova Scotians and other Canadians, can have a consistent format of proof of vaccination that's easily accessible that then perhaps could be used, whether it's for international travel, travel across, uh, uh, across the country, and even there may be some private in, uh, organizations here in Nova Scotia, businesses that want to use that as well. What we're focused on is making sure people have ready access to that proof of vaccination, as well as encouraging every Nova Scotian who can get vaccinated to be vaccinated, and then they can use that proof of vaccination. Next, we'll go to Truro News, Chelsea Gould. Go ahead, Chelsea. Thank you. Dr. Strang, in the Back to School Plan, it states that absenteeism of 10% or a higher absent rate than expected will be reported to public health. Can you explain the reason for this measure and what public health would do with that information? So that's not new. That's been a long-standing uh, uh, policy we've had in place for, for years. I've been here for 20 years, and it was here when I got here. It's simply that if schools have uh, uh, are seeing a, a significant number of, of both students and staff, and we've chosen 10% as the cutoff, which seems to be from a common source, you know, they're getting lots of people phoning in first thing in the morning and seems to be a bunch of similar illness, well, we, we want public health to know about that, and then local public health will do some investigation to try to figure figure it out. With COVID, it becomes even more important because what we want to do then is saying, okay, we have a bunch of, of, of people in a school which have COVID-like symptoms. Maybe we want to figure out how do we actually uh, facilitate some testing to really try to understand what's going on in the school. But this is not new related to COVID. It's just COVID makes it even more important. And so we've worked, we're, we're actively working with the schools to make sure that the schools understand their responsibility and have uh, protocols in place so they can collect that information and if they hit that target to make sure that they know uh, how to uh, timely contact a pu local public health. Next we'll go to the Guysboro Journal, Lois Ann Dork. Go ahead, Lois. Yes, hello. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, what opportunities are there for parents and guardians who don't want to send their children to school if masks are no longer mandatory in Phase 5? Um, and I'll take us. I mean, I think that like any uh, a reason why their uh, parents may not want to have their children in school, I think having a conversation with the principal, school administration, uh, and as a, as appropriate, uh, you know, uh, virtual learning or or, or take home learning uh, arrangements could be made, you know, with that, uh, you know, with, with that student. So, but I think really the conversation, the school, the parents, the family with the with their school administration. Now heading down to Liverpool, Ed Halverson at QCCR News. Go ahead, Ed. Thank you. I'm wondering what conversations have been had regarding how you determine what services will be available to Nova Scotians based on their proof of vaccination, such as, you know, students can be in school, but can I go into a restaurant or a retail outlet? And what can they ask of me as far as requiring proof of vaccination or to allow me in there? 
Yeah, go ahead. So I, I think we have to understand that, uh, you know, as government, uh, you know, we're going to, public health is going to give advice, and we're looking at that as what is the role of government in that. Uh, there, there certainly is a space for a private organization or a business, as we're seeing now with some universities, to create their own uh, vaccination policy. Uh, and if they choose, uh, for reasons of whether it's workplace safety or creating a safe uh, social environment for their customers, if they choose to uh, have a vaccination policy, uh, that they're able to do that. My message for the last number of weeks has just has been simply been saying that make sure that you do your work because there are legal, uh, you know, privacy, uh, human rights issues that you need to be aware of as you're as you're creating those policies. One of the one of the key things is that you're not denying somebody that there are very small numbers of people, uh, and I stress very small, who cannot get the COVID vaccine. Uh, and so those people, like other like other people with disabilities, they need to be accommodated. So you need to figure out if uh, how you're going to do that. So, uh, but again, with uh, those that advice I give to people around making sure you look at this from all those contexts, there's certainly nothing that would stop a private business organization going down that road. And that's why we're focused on making sure Nova Scotians have a very easy access to a digital form of proof of vaccination. Uh, so they have that if they're asked for it. And just, uh, Ed, thank you for the question. I mean, just in terms of, in terms of um, the province is not contemplating anything along those lines. That, that advice was to private, private businesses, I think. Um, there was some talk uh, towards the end of the campaign about uh, a Scotia Pass concept, I think, Ed, that was maybe along the lines you're talking about. But that was not something that bubbled up from public health. Um, so the province is uh, contemplating phase five reopening with, you know, restrictions removed. That's, that's what we're contemplating right now. If that's, if that's the heart of your question, Ned, that's the answer. Next, we'll move on to Six Rivers News, Bill Martin. Thank you. And my question for the Premier-designate, of greater concern for some is the question of centralized decision-making in Nova Scotia Health. So notwithstanding the approach to COVID, will your government be looking at putting some authority back in the hands of local leaders who may in fact have a better feel or a better understanding of local needs and deficiencies? Hey, Bill, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, we will. We, we've, we, we talked about that as, you know, respecting local voices, respecting the, the, the knowledge of, of communities uh, in education and, and, in, and in healthcare. So that, that's something that we're, we're actively going to make sure that there's an, an appropriate mechanism where local voices have a say um, in what happens in their community. Moving on, we'll go to CBC's Blair Rhodes. Yes, I have a question for Dr. Strang. Um, today, the FDA uh, gave full approval to the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, up to now, all the vaccines have only been approved on an emergency basis. I'm wondering, does this in any way change the, the playing field here in Nova Scotia? No, that's, that's a dynamic of the regulatory approach and, and policies in the United States. Uh, we have uh, both AstraZeneca and both and the two mRNA vaccines, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, which have been fully approved and therefore li in licensed uh, by Health Canada. So the FDA, that, that U.S. Uh, decision makes no change here in Nova Scotia or Canada. Moving on to CTV, Suzette Beliveau. Hi there. Um, just going back to um, looking ahead to phase five, um, and I've just heard from many business owners around here looking at the exposure list and perhaps what it does to business for them when they see their name on there. Um, so a lot of people wondering if those exposure lists will continue once we enter phase five and if that's something um, you're looking at, at keeping up. Uh, those are all like low risk exposure so that's absolutely one of the things we're actively looking at right now with public health about the need and value of those also recognizing the impact it does on when you identify a place uh, a business so under active uh, discussion within public health and we'll bring forward a recommendation moving on to tim biscay at the examiner yes uh hello uh, Dr. there was a uh, as i see it in phase five starts there's going to be uh, two tiers. Uh, everyone living in Nova Scotia, no restrictions, the only restrictions on travelers. That misses a middling group, I think, that, that you imposed during, during the uh, second outbreak. 
and that's household members of travelers who had to self-isolate. I'm thinking specifically of young school children of unvaccinated travelers who might be a vector back into the schools. Um, can you speak to that? So, uh, in general, if people are coming in and they're unvaccinated, they have to quarantine. Uh, we have protocols in place. If they quarantine in a house with other people, they have to be isolated from those other people, uh, have no close contact. Uh, it doesn't mean that they can come and just live uh, uh, with, with, a, with a family or, or, or family or friends here in close contact because that's not isolation. So, uh, we have those protocols in place that people would be expected uh, to follow. Uh, if they're required, whether it's seven or 14 days of isolation upon entry to Nova Scotia. And finally, on the list, we'll go to Kyle Shaw with the coast. Kyle, are you there? Sorry, I was just, hi, yeah, sorry, I was just fiddling with my phone. Uh, Dr. Strang, I've got a question about breakthrough cases, actually. Um, June 4th was the first date uh, the province started reporting on it. And on June 4th, 0.6% of cases were uh, of, of new COVID infections were among people who had been fully vaccinated. Last Friday, that number had nearly doubled to 1%. How much of a concern is this rate rising so quickly, given that 1% is still such a tiny proportion of the total? So as I've said from the very beginning, when we talked about breakthrough cases, that the more the higher your percentage of your population that is vaccinated, the higher the percentage of the of the cases will be breakthrough cases. It's just simple math. If most people are are, are fully vaccinated, uh, then most of your cases are going to be fully vaccinated. Uh, it, but it still is only one percent. So the breakthrough issue is uh, we're open and transparent about it. Uh, I think the take home message is that people that, you know, vaccinations are not 100%. Uh, and so even if you are fully vaccinated, making the choice, once you once we uh, no longer mandate it, making the choice to follow the public health recommendations around masking in indoor places, hand washing, etc., remains important if, if, even if you're fully vaccinated because your, your risk of being infected and transmitting to others uh, is greatly reduced, but it's not down to zero. Okay, we have a few more minutes. I'll take a, I'll go through the list, a um, couple more of the list anyway. Heading back to uh, Radio Canada, Adrian Blanc, do you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, Dr. Strang, um, how concerned are you by the fourth wave and precisely will the epidemiology in Canada be taken into account when deciding to switch to phase five? So uh, I think I, I am concerned about a fourth wave. It's clear, as I said in my remarks, it's clear we're entering the fourth wave and some provinces are already being substantively impacted already. Uh, we will get the fourth wave here. We had, as I said, you know, we will get some cases. We may get little clusters uh, in unvaccinated population. How we uh, minimize the impact of the fourth wave, it really is the key uh, driver there is our vaccination rate. But it's also why we need to maintain those border restrictions restrictions that, you know, entering here uh, and whether you need quarantine or not is based on your vaccine status. We want everybody coming to Nova Scotia to be doubly vaccinated uh, to help protect us of the introduction of the virus from other parts of, of Canada even. Um, and that's how we keep ourselves as safe as possible uh, through the fourth wave. The, the entering uh, the decision that to make to go to the to the phase five is really based on our local epidemiology and where we are at with our Nova Scotia vaccination rates, uh, because the, those are the key drivers about whether it's safe enough uh, to open up. We've already made the decision that we're going to maintain our border measures at least, you know, as we get through the fourth wave, uh, as that layer of protection of the introduction of the virus into Nova Scotia. Chelsea Gould, Toronto News. Do you have a follow up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so uh, you stressed that it's important for those eligible to get vaccinated, Dr. Strang. Uh, for teens whose parents do not support them getting vaccinated, do you have any messages for them? Well, I'm, first of all, uh, that I hope there, there can be a conversation uh, within that household. 
but at the end of the day, uh, that we actually have uh, long standing, and this is across the country, that individuals who are judged to be mature minors uh, by a health care provider, uh, it's, now, there's no specific age cutoff, but they have to be judged to be able, mature enough to be able to understand information, give their own informed consent. They are eligible to make their own choices uh, about whether to receive health care, including whether to receive COVID vaccination or not. Guysboro Journal, Lewis, do you have a, a question? Yep, one follow up, thank you. So I've talked about the entry into phase five as it pertains to vaccination rates. Is there a number of cases that would uh, mean we wouldn't move to phase five, even if we were 75 percent vaccinated? No, I've always said along it's, it, the decisions around epidemiology are not based just on a case number. It's always the, the trends that we're seeing and the, 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 the uh, average number of cases, a single, you know, that we're seeing over, you know, uh, time, uh, the context of the cases. Uh, right now, we're, we're still very comfortable what we're seeing. There's no sign of community spread. It's travel or close contacts uh, and, and or, you know, the number of contacts per case. So there's a number of things we look at, some of them number driven, some of them more contextual uh, that we get from public health follow up cases. And I talk with my MOHs on a regular basis and they give me both the science and art of what they're seeing. Uh, and then we make, you know, uh, make assessments and then bring those forward for decisions. So um, it, again, it's more than just a single number that would drive uh, any kind of decision around epidemiology. Okay, we're gonna move the questioning back to the room. Testing required for New Brunswick and uh, travelers from the rest of Canada for one dose and for no doses. So uh, if it's no, if you're unvaccinated, you have to evac you have to quarantine for 14 period. 14 days period. We, we, we don't require testing, but we certainly highly recommend that people get at least a test at the beginning and a test at the end of their 14 day quarantine period. Because um, we know that 14 days is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very sufficient period. If you're not sick at the end of that, then you're, um, then you're not, uh, you know, not, you know, you're not gonna have COVID. Uh, if you have a single dose of vaccine, you have to uh, vaccine, uh, sorry, isolate for a minimum of seven days and what we're saying is that you should that you have to get a uh, you have to get a negative test before you can come out of that isolation period. So if you don't get a test, you have to continue to uh, isolate even as day eight, nine, ten. So what we say, people get a test on day five or six, and then once you're, if that test is negative, once you hit day, day seven ends, then you can come out of that isolation. Mr. Houston, um, I know you're still probably working on your cabinet picks, but there are nine PC female PCMLAs to choose from. Can we expect to see some parity in this upcoming cabinet? Yeah, I'm excited about the cabinet. We have quality, quality uh, MLAs elected all across this province and, and um, we'll have a very, very capable cabinet for sure. Mr. Houston, in 2019, you introduced a piece of legislation that would have made vaccines mandatory for kids as they go into school. Is that something that you are still interested in pursuing? Um, no, but back to Natasha, the answer to your question is yes. Um, there, there will be, there will be, a, it will be a capable cabinet and it will be representative for sure. Um, um, that was a piece of legislation at the time that we, we uh, let's say we thought it was a good idea and in, in hindsight we, we backed away from that once we learned a little more. Mr. Houston, uh, the PEI as part of its uh, back to school plan has uh, plans to uh, hire some additional staff, teachers, support staff. Is that a consideration here, or will it happen here? Um, I think I think the it's almost in the same line as the ventilation question, and and just there's 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 lots of discussions to be had um, around around education and class sizes, and and making sure that students have the resources they need. We've committed to you know, the um, inclusion inclusion report and making those changes and stuff. So there's lots of discussions to be had, but um, not. Uh, specifically for, for as a COVID response, um, I, I wouldn't say like uh, for 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 the return to school, uh, we're, we're, we're confident that um, the COVID response, as it's put forward, will will make sure that everyone is safe um, and and uh, there's no other elements contemplated as part of a COVID response. But there's lots of discussions to be had around education. Mr. Houston mentioned earlier the <coughs> Scotia Pass idea that was floated during the campaign. Um, you'd kind of previously been averse to vaccine passports or the idea of them saying it could lead to less vaccination. 
I'm wondering if your position has changed at all or, or if you can elaborate on your position now in vaccine passports. So uh, my, my main position, I think, has been consistent all along is what I articulated earlier that uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, that we're we're not looking at that in general uh, as a government uh, kind of initiative, but that individual businesses and organizations, as I outlined to the answer to a previous question, have that capacity. But I've always advised them they need to look at, at legal human rights, other issues as they, if, if they go choose to go down that road. You said that, uh, Mr. Houston, sorry, you, you said that you spoke with the mayor about how the city got to the point uh, last week where folks were being evicted with police involvement. And then you said in that same sentence that obviously housing stock has been low and that's likely led to that outcome. So what is the logic behind ending rent control before housing stock has actually increased? Just the, the, my position on all, all the challenges that the province faces, and there are many, in health care, there are challenges in housing, there are challenges in rebuilding the, the economy. I think as a province, we, we, we can't convince ourselves that a, a couple sentences or a sound bite solve problems. We are more interested in actually getting to the root cause. So the solution to a housing crisis is more housing. Uh, we need more housing. That's the only way to solve a, a housing crisis. So um, I think there's lots of um, uh, ramifications of rent control that are actually not productive. To adding housing stock, so even even the commission wasn't wasn't in favor of that. So, I know that for some people, it's it sounds nice and it's easy to say. It's just a few words, but most of the problems uh, and challenges we uh, and opportunities that we have in this province can't be distilled down to just a few words. So, for anyone who says that um, uh, rent control is the solution to the housing crisis in this province. It's not. That's disingenuous to say that. So I won't say that because it's not the solution. So we really need more housing stock in this province. That's how we'll solve the housing crisis. Rent control is not the solution to the housing crisis in this province. It's just not. I'm sorry. But respectfully, though, sir, isn't it, if it's not the solution, isn't it the bridge? Because if you remove it before the stock that you acknowledge needs to be there is in place, where are people who are going to be priced out of their apartments? Where are they supposed to go if there if there aren't affordable if there's not affordable sufficient housing in place on the market? Well, I mean, if you if if you institute rent control, what does that do to those that were thinking about building stock? So you have to. There's all kinds of moving parts to this, right? So, well, what I want is more housing stock uh, in this province, and and we will take the steps to make sure that that happens. And we don't want to uh, do something in the interim that gets us away from achieving the goal that we need to achieve. So, look, we're going to have discussions with the, with the Commission. We're going to, we'll, we'll talk to um, not-for-profit groups. We'll, we'll talk to anyone who wants to talk uh, to us with ideas and solutions about how we bridge or, you know, what are, what are long-term solutions. We'll have those discussions. Um, we're anxious to have those discussions because nobody wants to see somebody homeless. Like, I don't want to see that. Um, so, um, but at the same time, uh, we have to make sure that we're, we're making decisions for the, for the long term. Um, so we'll get there. We'll, we'll have discussions with anyone who wants to talk about solutions for, for bridging, to use your word, or, or whatever is necessary in the short term. Those are discussions we'll have. But I just, I don't believe. Uh, that rent control is a way to a long-term solution to this pro the problem that we have here, and I think it could be a deterrent to a long-term solution. So we'll take one final, so one final question. One final question. Short-term solutions that you're proposing to do kind of right away. You yeah, know, we're going to. There's, there's, I'm hearing lots of ideas from from lots of lots of different sources. I mean, um, obviously, hotel rooms are something that people talk about. So we're going to we're going to make uh, we'll have a, a thoughtful discussion with the with the um, uh, different stakeholder groups and. And people who have ideas. So we understand there's we understand there's an issue, and we'll, we're going to have some thoughtful ideas on how we address it. That's all. Just on the issue of parity within the cabinet. Um, so can we expect to see a fair number of women involved in this cabinet? Yeah, we're going to. The, the cabinet will be one that um, is is equipped to address the challenges of this province. It will be capable people, and they'll be representative of of the geography and and gender of the province. That's all the time we have for questions. We'll turn it back to Mr. Houston for final remarks. 
Um, thanks everyone for, for coming. So I know it's been a little while, but we'll, we'll make sure that we're um, accessible for all kinds of issues in lots of formats as, as we kind of get through the transition here. And to, to, to Nova Scotians, I know that uh, I'm a new face here today to many of you, uh, but fortunately I'm sitting next to a very familiar face uh, whom you have come to trust in, in Dr. Strang. And, and I, want you to, I want you to be, uh, to rest assured, that um, my government and I personally will continue to work closely with uh, Dr. Strang and his team to protect the health and safety of Nova Scotians. That's our, that's our, that's our only goal. And we will do what is necessary uh, to keep you and your family safe. Uh, and, and I will work hard to earn your trust over time. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you everyone for coming today.